Welcome to EM Rapid. Now we will discuss about Cauley's fracture. First, we will talk about the anatomy. The distal radius is the only forearm bone that articulates with the carpal bones. That means the distal radius will articulate with the scaphoid and the lunate. Uh, whereas the ulna will not articulate with any of the carpal bones. So the radius itself is having three articular surfaces that will articulate with the uh, carpal bones, then with the distal ulna and the triangular fibrocartilage complex. And the ulna is separated from the carpal bones with the triangular uh, fibrocartilage complex. So ulna is not getting uh, articulated with the carpal bones, uh, but it is separated from the carpal bones with this complex of uh, fiber, fibrocartilage. So the wrist joint is the radiocarpal joint. And when we look at the wrist joint, the radial styloid is projected somewhat 8 to 18 millimeters beyond the ulna styloid. And the radial, uh, lower end of the radius is inclinated ab about 13 to 30 degree towards the ulna. When we take an x-ray of the wrist, we can see glula lines. These are three smooth arcs which are seen in the wrist. So, uh, the first arc is formed by the proximal surface of the um, uh, proximal carpal bones, that is the scaphoid, the lunate and trichotrum. And the second arc is formed by the distal surface of the scaphoid, lunate and trichotrum. And the third arc is formed by the proximal articular surface of the capitate and hamate bone in the mid-carpal joint. So, we can see these three lines in this figure. You can see these three lines delineated here. These are the three glula lines. And when we see the wrist joint, we can observe that the carpal bones are equidistant from each other. That means there is a, a 1 to 2 millimeter space between each carpal bone, and which is normal. And if at all some ligament disruption or anything is happening, there will be instability to that pattern and there will be uh, difference in spaces between the carpal bones. Mostly the uh, scaphoid or the scapho uh, capital lunate joints will be involved. So the uh, joints and ligaments associated with the lunate uh, will be involved and there will be difference in that. So that's the most common cause. And uh, when we observe the scaphoid, um, uh, when we observe the carpal bones, we can see that the scaphoid is in an elongated shape like this. And uh, scaphoid fractures are often missed. And when we look at this x-ray, we can see that the distal radius is, distal uh, the uh, styloid process of the radius is about 1 centimeter distal to the ulnar styloid process. And when we take the lateral x-ray, uh, we will be seeing the distal end of the radius. Then we will be seeing the lunate and the capitate bone. And uh, these all are collinear in lateral view. And the articular surface is somewhat shaped like a C. And this will be disrupted if there is a fracture happening. So in case of distal radius fracture and all, this uh, uh, collinearity will be lost. So we will move on to the Cauley's fracture as such. So Cauley's fracture it is a fracture in the distal end of the radius and it is at the cortico cancellous junction. That is, it is 2 cm away from the distal articular surface. So, it is an extra capsular fracture and uh, it usually happens when patient falls on an outstretched hand. So, uh, what is happening is the mechanism produces a distal radial metaphyseal fracture that is dorsally angulated and displays proximally. Uh, and what is happening is when we look at the fracture, the distal segment will be angulated and tilted dorsally and it will be somewhat pushed or pulled uh, proximally. And it usually it is seen in a woman of postmenopausal age group because of the osteoporosis. So here we can see when we are looking the AP view in an x-ray uh, from andro-posteriorly we can see that the fracture segment has proximally shifted and there is some radial shift and a radial tilt. It is, it is somewhat radially uh, rotated. And uh, when we check the lateral view, we can see that the proximal shift again can be seen and it is shifted and tilted 
more dorsally. So this can be seen in the X-ray. And associated with that, we can see uh, associated styloid process of ulnar fracture can be there. There can be rupture of the ulnar collateral ligaments and there can be rupture of the triangular cartilage of the ulna. So uh, we can see the uh, cartilages associated with the ulna in this figure. So there can be associated rupture of these ligaments also. And there can be even rupture of the introsious ligaments connecting the radius and the ulna. And, there, and which can cause the subluxation of the radio ulnar joint, distal radio ulnar joint. And if this fracture line is uh, extending up to the radio ulnar or radio carpal joint, this is called as a dive punch fracture. So there is a figure shown, in, uh, shown below the slide uh, that is extending up to the radio ulnar joint and the radio carpal joint. Uh, it, uh, here it is more shown to the radio carpal joint. So any of this is, uh, if any of this is there, we can call it as a dye punch fracture. And uh, usually X-ray is the uh, diagnostic imaging which is required to diagnose a uh, police fracture. But if in the ED we can do an ultrasound and see whether there is any cortical disruption happening in a bone and then we can diagnose a police fracture. And there can be some associated hematoma or joint diffusion seen because of the fracture. So diagnosis, appearance wise, how will we diagnose? So there can be pain, swelling and deformity of the wrist. And we can see some tenderness and irregularity in the lower end of the radius. And there is a classical dinner fork deformity which is seen. Uh, it is seen because the radials, uh, because of the fracture, the distal fragment is getting proximally shifted and the uh, proximally shifted and there is a dorsal displacement so because of that the distal fragment will be seen somewhat up when the patient is keeping the hand in a pronated position so that is called as a dinner fork deformity and when we check the x-ray we can see that because of the proximal shift of the distal radius both the styloids of the ulna and the radius will be looking uh, seen in the same level usually the radial styloid is uh, one centimeter lower but here we will be seeing both at the same level and patient might complain of paresthesia over the uh, uh, over the lateral two and a half fingers because uh, because of the involvement of the median nerve so in this x-ray we can see in the ap view we can see the fracture line going and in the lateral view we can see the dorsal tilt So there is Frickman categories to divide these fractures. So uh, we know police fracture is an extra articular fracture. So if the, every, if the fracture is completely extra articular, the complications are less and the anatomical alignment can be achieved. But in uh, Frickman class 2, uh, sorry class 3 and 4, it will extend up to the radiocarpal joint. So it, uh, there is an intracapsular involvement also. So that will cause an instability. And if the, uh, in type 5 and 6, it will extend into the distal radio ulnar joint. So that is also not very stable. And in type 7 and 8, it will involve both the radiocarpal and the distal radio ulnar joint. Uh, so it is a very uh, highly unstable fracture. So depending on the stability and the involvement of the other joints, we have classified this. So as we told in the X-ray AP view, we will be seeing the distal metaphyseal fracture of the radius associated with shortening. And if at all there is any combination that can be seen and the lateral tilt also can be seen. And in lateral view, we can see the dorsal tilt angulation and combination can be seen. And a fracture is called as unstable fracture if there is more than 20, degree, 20 degrees of angulation if there is involvement of the intra-articular uh, involvement, that means the radiocarpal or the radio ulnar joint is involved, and that will make it unstable. Then if there is marked combination, then that is also a sign of instability. And if more than a centimeter shortening is there for the fracture, then that is also unstable. And in advanced osteoporosis also, it is considered as unstable fracture. Now we will discuss about the pain management. 
In this session, we will be mainly discussing about the pain management and the close reduction and um, close differential diagnosis to Coley's fracture. We will not be discussing much on to the surgical management. We are mainly looking to the Coley's fracture on an ER point of view. So, uh, our main focus is pain management. So, pain can be managed with systemic analgesic drugs. According to WHO, uh, pain ladder we can give paracetamol, NSAIDs, opioids like that. But we know that the uh, patients who presents with Coley's fracture are elderly people. So, NSAID can uh, affect the renal function and opioids can cause respiratory depression. So, we will be preferring uh, a uh, analgesic which will not have much systemic action. Next is splinting. So splinting can be easily be done. We can splint the uh, area which is having deformity and we can then shift the patient for x-rays. Uh, then we can uh, before so before making a diagnosis itself we can splint those areas so that the patient will not have much pain. Then is uh, the procedural sedation. That is usually done in case of uh, fracture reduction and all. So procedural sedation, I will not be talking about uh, it now because we have a different session on that. Uh, then uh, we can give Bayer's block or hematoma, which are the regional anesthesia, which can be given in Coley's fracture. So first we will talk about the splinting. So in our ED, so uh, before splinting, we will have to evaluate the neurovascular status of that uh, affected limb, uh, which should be done along with the examination of the uh, fracture. So, uh, which is very important because uh, we don't know some vessels or nerves are involved. So, that should be done in the initial examination part itself. Then, if you are planning to splint, we will be taking a 3 to 4 inch width splint for upper extremity and if, if we are uh, planning to splint the lower extremity we will be taking 5 to 6 inch width splint so uh, this is coli fracture so we will be taking a 3 to 4 inch width uh, splint for the upper limb and we will be immobilizing the joints above and below the fracture so um, in since the wrist is involved we will be planning to immobilize the fracture uh, the joints from the uh, metacarpophalangeal joint to the elbow we will be uh, immobilizing. So we will not splint the uh, fracture circumferentially uh, because if the patient has some impaired sensation or significant swelling or any circulatory insufficiency that can uh, worsen this condition and that can cause a compartment syndrome. So uh, we will not splint it circumferentially and uh, splinting is just for the uh, sake of pain reduction. So that is not a definitive management. So we will not circumferentially splint and uh, provide adequate slings to support the uh, sling, uh, splint. So, uh, uh, we will have to give any slings from the neck downwards to support the splint. And in Coley's fracture, uh, sugar tongue splint is usually preferred. So, uh, it is of different types. There is proximal sugar tongue splint and distal sugar tongue splint. So, proximal is usually used for humeral fractures and distal is used for forearm and wrist fractures. Um, distal uh, sugar tongue splint is also known as reverse sugar tongue splint. So, uh, how we will be applying this? So, it extends from the metacarpophalangeal joint on the dorsum of the hand along the forearm and, which, and it will wrap around the elbow back onto the volar aspect till it will reach the mid palmar crease. So, this is how we make the splint. And uh, so, by doing this, we will be immobilizing the uh, elbow, forearm, wrist up to the metacarpophalangeal joint. Uh, and by doing this, uh, we will, we, this patient will be able to move the finger. So, there will not be much finger stiffening produced during that time. Next is the Coley splint, which, which is used in fractures of the second to fifth metacarpal and if there is any fracture of the wrist of or the uh, distal forearm, it is an alternative to the distal or the uh, reverse sugar tongue splint. And after splinting, and after splinting, we will have to uh, constantly evaluate the patient and ask for any numbness, tingling or increase in pain. And uh, we will have to uh, check for any pallor, pain, paresthesia, pulsenesses or paralysis. And uh, in order to reduce the swelling because of the uh, fracture, 
that has happened we can ask the patient to elevate the limb and give eyes to the patient uh, so that the swelling will reduce so this is all about splinting now we'll move uh, and discuss about the regional anesthesia first we'll talk about the bias block so uh, it is a dense anesthesia in the limb it can give the give anesthesia up to one hour that is 60 minutes so uh, bears block is a iv block uh, which is giving we will be isolating the limb which is to be anesthetized and we will be uh, giving a iv anesthesia through that area so we will have to place two IV lines, one in the affected extremity and other in the unaffected extremity. Um, and the unaffected extremity through that IV line, we will be giving fluids. And the affected uh, um, extremity, uh, the IV line, it is used to give the IV uh, anesthetic, anesthetic drug. So uh, in the affected limb, first we will be applying a double cuff pneumatic tourniquet uh, with adequate padding. So, uh, in this figure, uh, you can see a double cuff pneumatic tourniquet is there. It is not our usual BP cuff. It is having two cuffs actually. So, we will apply that and before inflating, we will elevate the upper limb for 3 to 4 minutes or we will wrap the extremity from distal to proximal end. And then we will inflate the distal cuff first. Then after that, we will be inflating the proximal cuff. And after inflating the proximal cuff, we will be deflating the distal cuff. So we will be inflating up, up to 250 to 300 mmHg. Then after that, we will take 1% lidocaine and we will add an equal amount of normal saline. And we will make it into a solution. And we will give 3 to 6 ml of this 0.5% lidocaine solution for every 10 kg of weight of the patient and uh, we will be giving that and the anesthetic effect will come within five minutes so first the smaller uh, nerve fibers will um, get involved and uh, later on the, uh, there will be a reduction in the pain and temperature sensation and then uh, ultimately there is there will be loss of touch the pressure and the motor function also will be affected so uh, that time we can um, if at all we are planning to reduce, we can do that procedure at that time. Then after, after, after getting adequate analgesia, we will be removing the cannula. Then if at all this patient is feeling any pain or pressure at the tourniquet site, we will, what we will do is, so we know that here the proximal cuff is inflated. So we will slowly reinflate the distal cuff and then once we make sure that the distal cuff is adequately reinflated, we will then deflate the proximal cuff. So uh, uh, that is how we do that. And the cuff should not be released for less than 30 minutes after uh, lidocaine infusion. So we told that it is an IV preparation and if the lidocaine goes into the systemic circulation, it will cause systemic toxicity. So uh, uh, before 30 minutes, even though if the procedure is over, we will not release the cuffs and we will not allow this for a systemic toxicity. So after the procedure, how will we release these cuffs? So after the procedure, lower the cuff pressure every 5 to 10 seconds by uh, uh, lower the cuff pressure initially then we will again reinflate it for one to two minutes then again we will lower the cuff pressure and this will be repeated three to five times and we will monitor the patient for next 30 minutes and look for any features of local anesthetic toxicity because this preparation is given intravenously and then uh, gradually 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 only we will be removing the cuffs so that was the bias block or the IV anesthesia. Now we will discuss about the hematoma block. So in hematoma block, uh, first we will have to uh, use an antiseptic solution and anesthetize the area of the colis fracture. Then using sterile technique, uh, a 10 ml syringe with 5, uh, 5 to 8 ml of 1% lidocaine without epinephrine is taken and it is attached with a 22 gauge needle. Then we will palpate the area of the wrist with the fracture and whenever we are feeling that step of feeling of fracture, we will be inserting the needle 
to the dorsal aspect of the wrist as shown in this figure and then we'll advance gradually and we will be directing towards the fracture and when we are going inside we should continuously aspirate till we get a flash of blood at the needle tip so uh, if we get a flash of nip that uh, that uh, blood that will mix with the lidocaine solution and then we will directly inject into the fracture site so uh, these are the two regional anesthesia which is practiced in colis fracture now we will discuss about the treatment so treatment if it is a stable fracture uh, we will have to give compression dressing and we will be splinting that area and uh, we can ask the help of our orthopedic friends also otherwise if it is not so stable we can uh, redu reduce it in the ed we will be doing a close reduction as will be performed so under regional anesthesia we will be one person will have to give traction and other person will have to give a counter traction so uh, traction is usually given by shaking the hands of the patient affected extremity and the counter traction is given with by an another person from the opposite side so the uh, goal is to uh, uh, the traction is done uh, so that the proximal shift will get disimpacted then a third person will have to restore the volar tilt so uh, this fracture is already tilted dorsally so we will have to restore the volar tilt and inclination uh, so that we will be getting the proper length of the radius so, okay so i will show the figure here so one person is giving attraction by shaking the hand with the patient and counter traction is given just below the elbow and the third hand is coming and it is correcting the uh, dorsal tilt by giving a volar tension is given and that is how it is corrected then after giving that uh, after correct, correcting the dorsal tilt, then we will have to pronate the hand and then we will have to correct the radial tilt. So after reduction, we will be taking the check x-ray and uh, after close reduction, uh, we will be applying the sugar tongue splint. After splinting only, we will be taking the check, uh, check x-ray. Then we will have to immobilize the limb for six weeks. Uh, instead of sugar tongue splint, we can apply short arm cast also, but make sure that it should be wipe by valve so that uh, the edema or the swelling will not uh, increase in that area and will not cause any uh, compartment syndrome. So uh, the uh, edema should go out. And if this fracture is unstable, we have already discussed what all factors which cause which will cause the fracture unstable. Uh, if at all this is unstable or if it is severely combinated or if there is any intra-articular uh, involvement this will require surgery and if there is if it is an open fracture or if there is an associated compartment syndrome or if the neurovascularity is compromised we should involve the orthopedic surgeon immediately and uh, he should be operated as early as possible now we will talk about the complications so the complications are finger stiffness because of lack of exercise and this can be prevented by actively moving the joints uh, uh, because the fingers will be anyway outside the plaster. So uh, the patient should actively uh, move the fingers. Then uh, malunion can happen and this will uh, person will continue to have the deniform deformity uh, but it will not hamper the day to day activity of the patient. Uh, then there can be shortening of the radius as I told uh, there will be shortening of radius because of the proximal tilt. Uh, so uh, because of that there will be subluxation of the uh, distal radio ulnar joint and there will be a prominence of the ulna and there will be pain. So in such condition uh, corrective surgery might be required. And if the ulna nerve is getting compressed, uh, patients might go into uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and this will repair carpal tunnel syndrome, repair or release will be required. Then other complications are sodex osteoid dystrophy, which is usually seen after plaster removal. There will be pain, stiffness and swelling of the hand and the overlying skin will appear stretched and glossy and the treatment is by doing intensive physiotherapy. And there can be other uh, complications like fracture to the triangle, 
triangular fibrocartilage complex or uh, the fracture or instability to uh, the uh, instability to the radio ulnar joint or the radio carpal joint can cause arthritis of that joints and there can be associated rupture of the other tendons especially the extensor pollicis longa tendon uh, which might require a tendon transfer surgery later so this is all about the police fracture now we will discuss about the uh, close differential diagnosis that is a smith fracture so a uh, smith fracture is a reverse police fracture uh, it is same as the colis fracture, only difference is that the angulation is different. Uh, in colis fracture, we told it is angulated dorsally and in Smith fracture, it is angulated in the volar aspect and it is tilted in the volar aspect. So, uh, uh, below this slide, we can see two images. So, uh, first is the colis fracture. So, here the distal segment is dis uh, displays more distally sorry more dorsally and uh, the uh, on the right side we see the smith fracture so here we can see the distal fracture segment is uh, displays more uh, to the volar aspect so uh, we'll see a dinner fork deformity in case of police fracture and the deformity in smith fracture is called as a garden spade deformity and this usually happen if the patient falls on an outstretched hand in supination or if there is a direct blow to the arm uh, to the wrist or the hand from the dorsal aspect the uh, there will be smith fracture and the uh, distal segment will be more angulated to the volar aspect so this is an x-ray we can see that distal part is uh, more angulated dorsally the distal part uh, is tilted dorsally you can see the fracture segment like that and it is clearly seen in the lateral x-rays and the treatment and the complications are same as that of colis fracture uh, the only thing is while reduction uh, we, uh, while reduction we told we will be correcting the dorsal tilt in case of colis fracture so in this we will have to correct the uh, volar tilt in smith fracture and uh, after applying the splints or the uh, or the uh, slab we will have to immobilize for six weeks next differential diagnosis to police fracture is the barton's fracture uh, but it is an intra-articular fracture of the distal radius and it can extend either anteriorly or posteriorly so anteriorly means uh, to the volar aspect or posteriorly means the dorsal aspect and because of this there can be injuries to the ligaments also so uh, that will cause radiocarpal instability and premature degenerative arthritis so management uh, we can take uh, the ap view and the lateral view so ap view will uh, show the uh, distal radial metaphyseal fracture and um, lateral view will show the intra-articular fracture of the volar or the dorsal rim of the radius and if at all there is some sub subluxation that can be seen usually in Barton's fracture there will be some subluxation so that also can be seen and um, management wise we can use the same sugar tongue splint and we, uh, it should be evaluated by orthopedician and uh, a manipulation and close manipulation can be done and kept in a plaster cast but if at all this patient is young and if the close reduction fails and if at all uh, there is instability or if there is more than 50 percentage of the radial articular surface involved and if there is any uh, uh, carpal bone subluxated then this patient is required open reduction and internal fixation so uh, these are these are the main close differential diagnosis to colis fracture so uh, this is about the colis fracture we have mainly focused on to the uh, splinting and uh, regional anesthesia and how to uh, reduce this uh, uh, colis fracture and the differential diagnosis i hope you have understood thank you